So I wish you a good webinar, and I hand over now to Atze Bustra, Vice President of RIVA. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anita. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm just going to open my slides. Um, can you see them now? I think you should uh, share your screen first. So click on oh, the sorry. start yeah. and then share screen. Um, I forgot where to find this. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. This is the one. Yes. Let me go. Okay, you can see it now, I think. Yes, everything's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so the title of my presentation is uh, Two Words, HEA NZAPS. Well, what do I mean with that, HEA NZAPS? Well, actually, that's what the presentation uh, is about. So let's, let's start. Um, yeah, I grew up in uh, the northeast of the Netherlands. Uh, this is in the far corner of the province called uh, Denten. And uh, I remember when I was uh, in the 70s uh, at the primary school, I had some friends that had stories about their grandparents growing up in these kind of houses. So, I mean, it's just three or four generations ago, depends of course on uh, the age of the listeners, um, that uh, a large part uh, of the Europeans lived in conditions uh, like this. Uh, of course, you also had people living, uh, poor people living in the, the cities, for example, and and all these houses, uh, uh, at least the houses of the poor, of course, there were rich people too, uh, they were pretty shitty in terms of uh, indoor climate, in terms of mold, moisture, uh, all kinds of diseases uh, that you would get from, from the homes, and uh, um, not enough daylight, uh, uh, no fresh water, problems with plumbing, uh, uh, a lot of things like that. And actually, this was the reason that already in the 1850s, but but in most European countries, it was more towards, the, uh, towards 1900, that uh, uh, government started to develop uh, building uh, regulations. <clears throat> in, in, at least in my country, it was around 1900, but I know uh, a couple of other countries that have the same uh, dates. Uh, we, uh, uh, we started, uh, uh, we introduced a, like a housing act, and this housing act was all about health and comfort in uh, buildings. It was about fresh water supply, plumbing, uh, enough windows, daylighting, uh, uh, fresh air, ventilation, uh, preventing mold and moisture, uh, about heating. Uh, so, so this this whole idea to to think about buildings and and how to regulate them, it started with uh, ideas about uh, how to make healthy, comfortable living environments and uh, for for everybody, but especially for for the poor. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, in, in turn led to uh, a whole new way of building, uh, uh, like apartment blocks. Uh, a lot of uh, like modernist architects they started to be interested in this, and, and they kind of reinvented the way we we build for uh, like those with like average or low uh, incomes. Like to the left is, is an example from the Amsterdam School of Architecture. At the middle, of course, is a French example from the Corbusier apartment uh, building. On the right, of course, it's uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe. This is actually in Chicago, but anyhow, uh, so, so we started building uh, uh, more healthy and happy. And, 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 and yeah, basically thinking about daylight penetration, enough uh, fresh air, uh, and uh, things like that. So. Of course, then uh, in the 70s, we started thinking about, well, it's nice, all these new kind of uh, buildings. And, and the same kind of developments happened around schools and offices, for example. But then it was like, okay, this new way we are building now, it actually uses quite a lot of uh, energy. And uh, because in the 70s we had the energy crisis, uh, some people started to thinking about global warming, we had the flip of Rome. Um, I myself remember uh, like playing on the, on the highways because on some days the roads were uh, closed for cars and because we, uh, so the government decided to save petrol on, uh, on Sundays. And so the 70s came, and this actually brought awareness about the energy performance of buildings, not just uh, health and comfort. And this awareness about the energy performance of buildings, in turn, led to a new way of building, where um, uh, we, we started making houses with small windows, with limited uh, fresh air supply, 
uh, of course, with solar panels on the roof, for example. Uh, I mean, these were, this was already later on. We started calling these kind of homes like passive uh, uh, passive homes, um, and of course, again, the same development in other types of buildings like schools and offices. So a lot of focus on the energy performance, uh, insulating, um, and and yeah, maybe we drifted away a little bit from looking at the health and comfort part uh, performance towards the uh, energy performance of, uh, of buildings. Uh, this in turn maybe uh, question mark uh, led to uh, buildings and uh, living environments that were not always that healthy. Uh, there are examples of uh, certain types of uh, insulation that that are used that that. Uh, um, maybe uh, are leading to people uh, having certain uh, diseases, uh, so bad air quality and uh, people having uh, lung problems, for example. Uh, you, 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 you probably saw, saw these kind of articles, like questions like, are green buildings uh, killing us? Uh, we started talking in the 80s about sick building syndrome. Um, and, and a lot of people at the time, and, and maybe still, uh, ask the question like these uber uh, en uh, energy efficient buildings, are they making us ill? Are they actually introducing air quality, thermal comfort, maybe lighting uh, problems? And of course, this is not what we want. Uh, well, as uh, I run, uh, I've been running a consultancy company specialized in the air quality and health performance of buildings. And, and, and during the last 20 years, I saw uh, indeed uh, certain problems quite often in uh, high, high energy performance of buildings. Uh, some things we see a lot, not just in homes, but is like if there's too much focus on energy, kind of people and designers kind of forget about the fresh air supply, so you can end up with like uh, worse in the air quality than in like 100 year old uh, buildings. Not always, but uh, mold and moisture problems is something you see a lot, especially when you renovate old buildings into like uh, energy efficient buildings, and that's mold and moisture problems in their construction, for example. One thing I see a lot is overheating, so especially in apartment uh, buildings. So uh, if you have energy efficient buildings that at the same time has a lot of glass facing south without solar protection, uh, this, this, this happens a lot, overheating. Uh, energy efficient buildings that have limited uh, options for personal control over temperature, especially in winter, and this is not what people expect. Uh, they, they, they want, especially in their home, to be able to control the temperature. And if you have like slab heating systems, um, then sometimes they end up to be very, very slow. And uh, and again, people expect to be at least, especially at home, at least somewhat in control over their own uh, temperature. Uh, inadequate, inadequate daylighting. So I've seen projects with very, very small windows. And, and this is one of the first things that people notice. I mean, that people like to have enough light, uh, daylight in their homes. And, uh, and another thing I've seen in these uh, uh, homes uh, that are Built or renovated with an overfocus on energy performance is noise from insulation. So you introduce heat pumps and all kinds of devices like mechanical ventilation systems, and 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 the designer kind of forgot about noise, and so they end up quite noisy. So people unplug them, and then you get all kinds of other problems. So uh, I'm not saying this just to say that building with uh, energy performance in mind is a bad idea, but with just energy performance in mind, you can end up with these kind of uh, Okay, then, then is building uh, energy efficient, does it always lead to health problems? I think the answer is, is no. This is a, a graph from the European uh, audit project. It's already quite a while ago. This, this happens to be an example from office buildings, but you can make the same graphs for, for homes. On the x-axis, it's the so-called building symptom index. So it's an indication of the average amount of uh, one, one dot is one uh, office building. Uh, so the x-axis is about the building symptom uh, index. So it's the average amount of sick building symptoms that, uh, that people had in these buildings. If, you, if it's around one or two, it's quite limited. I think about uh, irritated eyes or dry air uh, uh, perceptions, things like that. And if it's like four or five, it's quite high. So the healthy buildings are to the left and the, and the, the, the sick buildings are to the right. On the y-axis, you see uh, the energy index, uh, energy use per square meter. Uh, so the bad buildings are on top and the good buildings are, are down below. And what you see here is that certain buildings, they score very well on the energy side and very well on the, the sick building symptom side. So they have quite a limited amount of uh, symptoms on average and they have good energy performance. And this is what you want, of course, as a designer. 
Okay, right here I want to make a, a car analogy. Uh, if you design a car, you can you can decide to to focus, uh, for example, just on energy performance, and then you end up with something like this. And of course, uh, you can ask yourself uh, how safe is this, or how practical this is if you want to go and shop for groceries, uh, for example. Of course, you can focus on on on, on comfort, uh, like making it quiet, making it a smooth ride. You end up with something like this, but then you can ask yourself. Uh, how, how energy efficient is this? Well, probably not. You can focus just on safety. You end up with something like uh, like this, or you can try to combine all of it. You and and you end up with something like this, maybe. But it's uh, actually quite expensive. You can uh, do do kind of find a compromise on also on price, and you end up with this is an all electric uh, car. Uh, you can end up with something uh, like this, and. Mm -hmm. If you look at this 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 car design, I think if you wanna wanna tick all the boxes, uh, it's just a matter of, of good design to think about uh, not just energy performance in this case, but also safety, enough space, uh, comfort, and, and that, that that is possible, uh, and that's actually the 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 way the thing to do when you want to do good design. Um, yeah, one. Lately, I see in, in a lot of countries uh, more and more interest in, in, in looking beyond just uh, energy performance and also looking at health performance, uh, good in the environment quality in buildings. And then people start inventing like their own guidelines and, and, and come up with their own ideas. Uh, people are, are keeping up with account in, in energy, energy performance. And I would very much like to point out that there's a lot of knowledge about how to make a healthy building. There's a lot of knowledge about uh, what uh, uh, like like uh, good indoor air quality. What to, what to do, what not to do. Uh, about how to to avoid the overheating. How to address uh, noise problems from installations. And some of these these conferences, like uh, the Healthy Building Conference, the first one was in '88. So I mean, they have a long history. Uh, so there's a lot of knowledge out there uh, about how to make good indoor environmental quality. How to to boost the uh, health performance of uh, buildings. And there's also a lot of scientific literature. This is from the Indo Air Journal, which is actually produced by the International Society of Indo Air Quality and Climate, that has been around also since the 80s. Uh, this is actually this, this specific uh, article refers to an EU funded uh, study about uh, and the, the question was how much should you ventilate to make sure that people are healthy? And it says down here, for example, that you should have an air exchange rate of at least 0 0.5. And in an office building, you should uh, ventilate ideally uh, towards uh, 20 25 liters per second. It's actually a lot. I mean, 10 or 15, I think, is already enough too. But uh, anyhow, so there's a lot of knowledge out there that can be used if you sincerely are interested in, in creating a healthy uh, building. Okay, back to the energy performance uh, of building directive. Anita said a lot about this already. Um, I just want to point out that in the original text, uh, when when uh, we started uh, with the EPPD uh, like more than 10 years ago, uh, in the original uh, political document, it said things like, um, okay, we should look at energy, energy performance, but we should do it in such a way that we don't have like side effects on the comfort health side. Literally, literally it said what, what is written down here, that the energy performance requirements uh, shall take account of general indoor climate conditions in order to avoid possible negative effects such as inadequate ventilation as well as local conditions and the designated function and the age of the building so so I mean, even the example inadequate ventilation is there and um, so of course it would be very logical now to start thinking about uh, general eu guidance in terms of indoor air quality maximum concentrations of certain aspects co2 maybe fine particles but also uh, enough fresh air supply. I need to also refer already to the Reva position paper that uh, uh, Reva produced, uh, I think about one and a half year ago. Um, and in the paper, uh, uh, one of the important things we said is that okay, we should look uh, uh, simultaneously at you know, environmental quality and energy efficient efficiency. And if we do that, we, we will start uh, producing or uh, renovating buildings that uh, the Europeans are waiting for. And if it's just, just energy performance we focus on, we might uh, introduce a lot of new uh, problems that, that, that we don't want. So. Uh, in the EPVD context, it's important to point out that their uh, CEN has developed a lot of uh, uh, standards 
in relation to EPBD and, and recently in relation to the EPBD uh, recast. Uh, I was involved myself in this specific uh, stand-up. Um, and this one is, is very much about in the environmental quality uh, parameters. So it gives uh, maximum levels for noise levels in buildings, minimum fresh air supply, uh, guidance of maximum temperature in buildings. So uh, this actually is a standard that's already there uh, and that can be used for anybody that wants to uh, make not just energy efficient buildings, but at the same time uh, healthy buildings. Um, <clears throat> Well, a few weeks ago, I was kind of happily surprised to hear that uh, the European Parliament uh, and, and, uh, is, is, is uh, well seeing the light, maybe I should say, uh, literally, um, because uh, there were some messages that uh, uh, certain Parliament members uh, pointed out that we should uh, be careful with like the overfocus on uh, energy performance, and especially ventilation and indoor air quality is uh, um, uh, is, uh, is important. And, uh, <clears throat> and and one thing I want to point out, of course, we have a presenter later on from EFA, but uh, it was very interesting to see that, that we kind of lobbied from the technical side to, to not forget about health and comfort and ventilation and air quality. Not, and of course, you have organizations like EFA uh, that is more like a health-oriented organization that, that kind of lobbied for the same. And it looks like we are, uh, at least in my eyes, we, are, we are, seem to be more successful than we had expected from the start. Uh, uh, so that's uh, good news. So uh, let's see what what happens with the EPBD uh, requirement. Okay. So uh, finalizing my uh, presentation, what I've I've been trying to do is to convince you that it's a good idea to uh, to look at energy performance of buildings. We need to do that. We have a global warming problem. Uh, it's good to, to start talking to each other in terms of net zero energy buildings. Uh, yes, that's a good idea. But let's not, not forget. Uh, let's not forget about health and comfort because that's what people want. They want a low energy uh, use. They want a low energy bill, but they also want, expect, need health and comfort in uh, in, in the building. And uh, in this context, I would like to point out that there's, that there's all kinds of developments uh, uh, that that actually focus more on the health and performance uh, aspect of uh, buildings. We have BREEAM, We have uh, HEA, so-called HEA requirements within BREEAM. Lately, we've seen uh, um, a growing interest in WELL. This is a, like a new certification scheme that only focuses on the health aspects, air quality, also good food, uh, lighting. Uh, so how, how about we, we start trying to combine the two? So we have the HEA approach uh, on the one hand, health. We have the net zero energy uh, building uh, approach on the, on, on the other hand. And how about we start talking in terms of HEA and their buildings. So buildings that like boost health and actually lower energy use and, and, and actually yeah, produce what, uh, what people, I think, really want. Okay, and uh, last remark, if you want to know more about this, I wrote a, a very short uh, article, actually it's one page, uh, called Towards HEA and Zaps, and you can find it actually on the Reva website uh, that you see to the side. Okay, thank you very much.